І тепер, шановні друзі, маю величезну приємність запросити до трибуни Дона Кальба, професора соціології Центрально-Європейського університету, який, власне, і був автором ідеї нашої конференції. Саме він запропонував оцю тематику взаємодія капіталізму та популізму за умов сучасного, модерну. І тема його виступу звучить у такий спосіб. Theory from the East, from double polarization to crypto-fascism. Don, the floor is yours. Well, no, first of all, I, I am actually sorry that, that I'm still demanding your attention, because this is a very long session, and, and I actually hope that you um, can continue to be involved. So, I'm an anthropologist, which is a very, very modest, well, I'm also a sociologist, but my primary work is in anthropology, and that is a very, very modest discipline in many ways, because we don't talk to the wealthy and the powerful, we talk to everybody, including the poor, the workers, the administrators, the secretaries, the street sweepers, and all of that. So I'm going to tell, and I also don't have a PowerPoint. I mean, in anthropology we tend to tell anecdotes, and so I want to stick to that, uh, to that tradition for a little bit. But the anecdotes are theoretically significant. And I want to go back first to uh, the moment before, I think it's May last year, 2015, in Budapest, um, where Orban halts as a strongman the flow of refugees from Syria. And very few people have asked why he actually did that. Um, I mean, if you are against immigrants in your country, you let them go through, and you let them go to Austria and Germany where they actually want to go, right? Few of these people would ever have stayed in Hungary. Um, nevertheless, he kept them in Hungary. Very paradoxical. Why would you do that? Well, he did it to set himself up as a strongman, and the strongman in relation to Jobbik, because this is all about domestic competition. So here you have this whole flow of refugees coming, um, refugees, of course, who are in the end the consequence of the Iraq war waged by the US and Britain, not by Germany and France. It's also always really very interesting to remember that Germany and France and the UN voted against the Iraq war and didn't send anybody. Nevertheless, they are now going to manage the flow of, uh, of, of, of migrants. Orban stands up and says they are not coming in and he builds a wall and he basically locks up in concentration camps the, uh, the, the people who come through the wall in, into Hungary. Now, my colleague Chris Han was doing anthropological research in the village where he had been doing anthropological research over the last 40 years, about 10, kilometer, 10 kilometers away from that particular wall that separates Hungary and Serbia. And so he's talking to people whom he has known for 40 years. What do they think of these refugees? And they basically say, well, you know, we have actually nothing against these refugees. We vote Orban or we vote Jobbik, but we have very little against these refugees. This is actually rather all very unfortunate. That's the first story. But then the second story comes up and they tell him, but what the fuck? They speak English so well. Not even our children, whom we have tried to educate as well as possible in Hungary, speak English like that. How is that possible? Are these poor people? No, they can't be poor people. And look at their smartphones. Nobody in this village has a smartphone like that. Are these miserable people? Apparently not. And now Angela Merkel is telling them to come to Germany. Nobody has ever invited us to Germany, but we would have always wanted to go. We are Europeans. 
But our European partners apparently like these Muslims much better than us Europeans. Right? These were the stories. So these were stories not so much about anti-foreigner xenophobic sentiments, but they were complex reflections about themselves in relation to world history. Turns out that the local economy is like this. There are no jobs except jobs in the work fair programs and in agriculture. If you are working in agriculture, you earn about 200 euros a month. Not the whole year, six or seven months per year. 200 euros a month. Now I know that my Ukrainian friends think that that is a very normal salary. But I also know that nobody in Western Europe realizes that in the EU, large chunks of people in Eastern Europe, not in the European South, are actually earning 200 euros a month. That's far below any poverty line in Western Europe, right? Now, if you are in the workfare programs, you earn, so those are, as it were, unemployed people, many of them are Roma, or they are people uh, very often with uh, alcoholic addiction or are, have, are in trouble, right? So they are in the workfare programs and they get 100 euros a month in the workfare programs. So this is the context of a village that votes either mostly Jobbik, the far right, or Orban, as it sees the um, Syrian refugees approaching um, and Angela Merkel saying, please come to Germany. What happens in a moment like this, and this is anthropologically very, very significant, and here of course I become the Marxist, is that issues of class can be turned into issues of culture, right? So at this moment, what Orban does is producing an electorate that is xenophobic on the surface, on a discursive level, that has been constructed as the Magyars against immigrants, and then later, of course, the Magyars against Merkel and Europe, but the Magyars are actually complaining about their class problems, about poverty, about complete unemployment, the collapsed local economy. Now, I've been doing research among industrial workers over the last 20 years in Eastern Europe and, among, and in Poland, and among them, exactly similar sorts of mechanisms have worked over time. So you see also there again, a transformation from class issues into cultural issues. This is my work on Poland. Um, I'm also talking again about people whose lives have been deeply stagnated for a 30, 40 year period, whose children find it very difficult to advance in life, who are around 2008 on a salary of 300 euros a month netto, um, hardworking, about 45, 50 hours per week with overtime, and they turn themselves over time into people who complain that they are Poles, that they are Poles, Poles, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> that they are Poles who deserve a better life. And they are being taken hostage by ethno-political entrepreneurs who set them up as Poles against the European Union. And this is, of course, this is, of course, the electoral basis of PIS. Now, PIS has done the great move to sort of solidify this particular claim. So what they have done is compensating for the absent wage raises over the last 20 years in industry, and of course this is internationalized industry, this is actually the, uh, the Whirlpool plant in Wrocław that I'm talking about, but it's, it's only one example. So, internationalization, 
700% increase of productivity, a, a murderous tempo on the workshop floor. I've actually been on that workshop floor and there is no recognition with when I was working in industry as a student in the 1970s in the Netherlands and Philips or in other places, you know, that was a sort of fun. Murderous tempo, tight discipline. And then you earn 300 euros a month. Now, the PIS has basically turned the stagnation in wages into uh, a very offensive claim for higher tax um, take on international capital on behalf of family benefits. Right? That is what has happened. That's the, that's the, the core, that's one of the cores of the program of the PIS um, in Poland. And so what they actually do is instead of setting up strong class-driven labor unions that can claim higher wages against international capital, that is, that is not on, that is not possible, there were no resources to do that. But what is happening now is a conservative party, a right-wing, you know, far-right conservative party, a liberal democracy that actually claims higher taxation income from capital and then redistributes it to uh, the Polish proletariat in the provinces. Now, in both Hungary and in Poland, it is very important to realize that the radical right that has rolled into the capital cities and has taken the governments in the last years comes from the east of the east. And when I say the east of the east, I mean the stagnating territories east of the capital cities. But it is a symbol more. It's, I mean, in a statistical sense, this is correct. It comes from the east of the east, and it is about class stagnation. And it is turned into cultural assertion of Polishness and Hungarianness versus Europe. But it is also a symbol, the east of the east, because stagnating groups in western Poland or in western Hungary um, also vote for the radical right. Now, what you see in, in Europe in the last years is not only the uh, deepening rift, and, and indeed it is a continuing rift within the Eurozone between the North and the South, now you also have the East and the West in uh, a contentious competition with each other where the Visegrad group, which used to be nothing more than a technical discussion group about standards of uh, adjustment to the West, um, legal standards, technical standards, etc., etc., um, has been turned into a political machinery of representing the right, the East of the East, the angry East of the East, uh, in relation to the West. So Europe is sort of falling apart. Western Europe has exactly similar processes over time. So I would say that Hungary has been the avant-garde uh, in a way in Eastern Europe for the rise of the right. But the Netherlands um, has been the avant-garde in a way in Western Europe. Now there you have exactly similar stories that the rise of the right happens in suburban deindustrialized zones over time. And the setting up of Dutchness against Islam and against Moroccanness in particular um, is all about making suburban deindustrialized workers envious and angry about benefits to the Moroccans. Right? That has been the historical origin of the rise of the right in the Netherlands. Now, so. Good. So this is about turning class into culture and by sort of disabling class action and labor action and horizontal solidarity and assertive claims on capital, um, disabling those claim claims, the shift from class to culture and the setting up of the right. In other words, the rise of the right is the problem of the left, right? And it's also therefore entirely predictable that the rise of the right parallels itself with the decline of social democracy. Well, labor is a good example of that. Labor in the Netherlands is the perfect example of that. Um, the same is true in Scandinavia and in Denmark, um, etc. Now, 
I want to say a few things about, no, I should actually say this. This is a universal process. Um, and it has a, a lot of local instantiations. But it's very interesting to see that in 2016 and 17, it has become sort of accepted as a universal process. And, and the key symbol of that is the symbol of the white working class, right? Until 2016 and 17, nobody cared about the white working class. And at once, because of Brexit and because of Trump, the white working class is the big thing to talk about. Now, there are two sorts of populism. In the discussion about populism, populism is now always sort of set up against new, the neoliberal administration of things. But there are basically two sorts of populism. Um, and that is a dyadic one and a triadic one. So dyadic, triadic. And the dyadic one is, is a left-wing populism. So populism is all about defining the population against an elite, right? Populism is, a, is, a, is an ideology, is a cultural ideological force. The population against the elite. In the dyadic one, the left-wing one, it's one homogeneous population against the elite. And in the triadic one, it is the population, the majority population, against the parasitic elite, but also against the surplus population. Immigrants, drunkards, people of color, they may be gays, anything that can be defined as the subaltern other. Now what has of course happened is, is the capacity of European states to generate this dyadic uh, populism um, has been repressed and as a consequence this triadic populism has been coming up. Now you should, we should understand this as very deeply ingrained structural processes. I call them relational processes because you can actually um, observe them on a very small scale, for example in this village in Hungary or in my, the town of where I did my studies in Poland in Wrocław, but they are also macro relational processes and I want to say a few words about these macro relational processes. So there are five and this I should actually have uh, projected, but there are five um, downward slopes, like this, right? in a, in a, on a graph. There are five key downward slopes that signify the wider context in which this transformation from class into culture and from labor to the right is happening. Now the first is the secular downward trend in the wage share in the global system. And I'm talking basically about the north, the global north. So this is the OECD, but it's absolutely true also for Ukraine and for Russia. Um, so the wage share, so it's easy to calculate. I mean, the total revenues in the system per year um, is the total revenue. And of that, you have a capitalist share and you have a wage share. Now that wage share has been declining since 1975, secularly over time actually more in Europe than in the US, that is also very interesting, but it used to be about 75%, it is now 65%. In Central and Eastern European nations, it's actually uh, less than um, 55%. So there the wage share is even lower. Now together with this, and of course the, the obvious side of this is that the capitalist share increases. In other words, wages drawn within the system have, have always been declining over the last 40 years in relation to the total productivity and capital has drawn ever larger profits from it. Um, this is the background to financialization and the deeper background to the financial crisis, but I don't want to go into that now. But, but in, clearly you can see that the larger the pool of capital, liquid capital that is taken out of the system, while purchasing power is declining, cannot be reinvested in the system, it becomes part of liquid pools that look for speculative uh, valorization. You don't need to be a hard Marxist to understand that. I mean, Stiglitz uh, would be writing about this too. He's a good social democrat. Now, that was the first downward slope. 
um, that helps to explain the shift from class to culture. Then there is the continuous decline in the taxation of capital going on at the same time. Part of that is because capital has been financialized over time. Um, also the taxation of the rich has been declining. So in, let's say in Western states, in 1975, uh, the, top, um, the top taxation level on the rich would be about 80%, 75%. The top taxation level on capital would be f around 40%. Taxation on capital is now a very, very uh, obscure thing, but it's mostly formally somewhere between 15 and 25%. Um, in practice, very often uh, 3, 4 or 5 percent. In, in Hungary, for example, and this is again sort of indicative for Central and Eastern Europe as a dependent capitalism, uh, the taxation on foreign capital is not more than 3 percent. Now the other, so here's the, the third declining slope, and that is electoral participation. In the context in which capitalism globalizes and financializes and leaves ever less for others to earn from it um, and refuses itself to be taxed, um, you see electoral participation declining in the system everywhere. Now, of course, it, it goes a little bit with hikes, but there is a sort of secular decline. Um, Central and Eastern Europe has elections where mostly only about 50% of people turn up. Um, when it becomes highly competitive, like in Hungary, it goes up again. It was highly competitive in the Netherlands and in France this year, and it goes up again. The secular trend is a downward uh, participation in elections. People increasingly don't see that they have a stake in the system of voting, which is, of course, a reflection of the declining capacity of the state to regulate the whole thing. In all of the electoral systems that we have, there is a decline. This is the, uh, this is the fourth declining slope. There is a decline in um, the proportion of voters who vote for the main established parties. Uh, in the last two years, that has become very, very visible everywhere. But again, it's a process of about 40 years of ever declining. The, the liberal center is ever declining. So here you have a secular process again. Um, when we talk about the problems in the European Union, again, these are very hard uh, relational processes that form the background of it. And then, finally, the decline in the interest rate. So that is a very, very, a very intricate one. Um, so over time, it doesn't start in 1975, it starts about 1985. But there is a sort of secular decline in the interest, go, in the interest rate going on, which basically means that the productivity of capital uh, is also declining. So over time, in, this, in these five slopes that I describe, you can on a sort of anthropological and sociological level conclude that labor, that the value of labor declines secularly to the point that it is not much worth anymore. I was talking about the 200 euro uh, in Hungary and the 300 euro in Poland. But you can also argue that capital is, not become, is becoming ever less valuable. Right? So we are in a system where both labor and capital are becoming devalued structurally. Now then there are two, two ascendant slopes that stand on the other side of this. And the first is the ever-increasing number of workers in the global capitalist system. So let's say by the end of 1970s, there were about 650 million workers in the system. Now it's about 3 billion workers in the system. Um, and it's projected to, uh, to, again, increase with about 50% um, as Indonesia and Vietnam, and of course, ultimately, India become integrated in the thing. Uh, Wallerstein would say we are reaching the asymptote, right? The asymptote where everybody has been proletarianized and um, the global population reproduces itself mainly by selling its labor power. Everybody is now a proletarian, not yet, but in about 20, 30 years from now, everybody is basically a proletarian. Uh, most people are also urbanized by now. 
Um, and we live in a system where all these urbanized proletarians, proletarians increasingly find it hard to make politically consequential claims on capital accumulation, while capital accumulation increasingly finds it difficult to valorize itself. So that is why it is so good to be an anthropologist and listen to small stories and at the same time to be a Marxist who understands the wider universal process that is going on here. I wanted to leave it at this point because I think there's things to discuss. It's also rather late. People are getting tired. I think I put a couple of things on the table that are very fundamental. So my argument is basically that we are moving into a structurally populist era. And what I mean with that is not just a high volatility of capitalism itself producing crisis uh, around every corner, but also a politics that cannot come into its own because the political formations that we have and the political frameworks that we have are still largely on the, national, on the, on the level of the nation state and they do not allow us to make consequential claims on globalized capital. It is very difficult to see how this stalemate can be broken through. So we will be, while well, the whole world will be proletarian, the whole world will be urban. It is very difficult to see how the whole world can regulate capital. Thank you. Um, Don, thanks a lot. But uh, of course, the question naturally arises uh, is there any way out of the system or uh, it's uh, going to collapse? Well, you see already how difficult it is in Europe. To regulate this, right? Europe has, on a world level, uh, by far the most thick collective transnational governance layer in place to actually address these questions. But that layer is largely used to deny these questions, uh, to keep them off the table rather than on, um, and to represent, well, you know, hegemonic self-interests, etc., etc. So, so. If within this context, even in Europe, we cannot define collective interests, what is this going to be on a world level? So yes, you are talking to a person who is structurally pessimistic, intellectually. I mean, for our disciplines, this is of course entirely exciting, right? We will have a lot to do. It's not the technicians over the, last, over the, over the next 20 years who will be asked to solve problems all the time. They will be asked, but they will fail all the time. And so there's, for us, there's a lot of intellectually exciting, politically exciting things to think about. Um, so in that sense, I'm an optimist. But intellectually, we must be very pessimistic. OK. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Don, uh, for uh, for the the, the talk. Um, I suppose th the question I've got, which is probably paralleling um, Pavlo's, is what's the you know what is the future? How do you think we the the, the centre left can be revitalised? I mean, the the issue in you know just to take a couple of countries that I'm quite familiar with. You know, in the UK we have a general election campaign where clearly um, Mr. Corbyn has, has gone out with a reasonably dramatic uh, election manifesto, but is probably finding it difficult to gain traction beyond certain Labour homelands. Uh, I mean, particularly the, the concern is in the, in the north of England, which have generally been fairly economically depressed and have actually had to rely on a lot of EU money are the same people who effectively voted for Brexit and therefore he's got a problem in that particular part of uh, the natural supporting electorate who've opted for UKIP or whatever. And also in Poland where essentially the, the trade union movement which would historically in virtually all the countries of the West have been the foundation stone for the centre-left parties. I mean, again, the you know, British Labour Party emerged from the trade union movement. But in, the, in, in Poland, the trade union movement is essentially 
um, very, very socially conservative and is actually supporting PIS. So uh, I suppose the question is, where do you see the sort of the, the, the center left going? Uh, with it, it's essentially its natural supports removed. Yeah. And also a sort of a, um, a concern that with the proletariat, that in fact the, the people who tend to be supporting the centre left are those who've got a vested interest in maintaining the, the public sector. But otherwise, you know, that, that sort of manufacturing part yeah. has essentially, you know, devolved to other countries. So that's, I suppose, my general question. Given, you know, clearly the, you know, the social democratic emerged from the sort of, particularly in Germany with the, you know, um, the SLD is also facing problems, but historically emerged from the sort of the Marx uh, and the other sort of um, parties of, of the 19th century. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, if you take this sort of macro reading seriously, then it is very clear that all the mechanisms that have historically grown in order to enable the left that then became their, inst in their instruments, the main policy instruments, have been switched off, right? So that is basically in place bargaining between labor unions and capital, and it is the social rights of the welfare state. Now, so these are basically over, right? So. They're stagnating, they're declining, they're becoming ever less effective. I think that is a structural issue, and it, it can't be solved on the level of the national state, and it can't be solved by just, you know, sort of bringing in more members into labor unions. It's, nobody knows what to do about it. Um, but it's, I think, very, look, there is a set of intellectual discussions going on um, around this, and in one of them, um, the concept of the precariat circulates as a core symbol. Now, the concept of the precariat does something very interesting because, of course, the precariat does not exist. It's highly divided among itself. Um, and, you know, when you, when you look at, um, when you look at the data, then, you know, the, the precariat concept tries to, tries to unify, let us say, the un unemployed or underemployed, highly educated, creative classes in the inner cities with uh, the workers in the provincial factories that are uh, threatened with redundancy, um, the already unemployed and, this, and, and uh, the, the surplus population. Right? So these have four very, very different, different trajectories within it. But it is, of course, very interesting to think about the possibilities of unifying them, right? So that is, for me, that there is no doubt that this is potentially a productive discussion. So I think that the concept of the precariat is much too economic in many of its respects. It's not political enough. Uh, that is also precisely the problem of how to do that. But this sort of a discussion is necessary. But of course, that is only a discussion basically on a national level. Um, it points, ultimately, to universal basic income of one way or another. So these are things that need to be on the table, and I'm actually very happy that, uh, I mean, Hamon, Hamois, what's his name, uh, socialist candidate of, in, the, in the French presidential Hamon. election was, yeah, was, was of course very weak. Uh, but it was very important that he put the issue on the table, and it is being discussed in many ways. Um, well, you know that, that major employers in Silicon Valley love the idea of the universal basic income because they are so acutely aware that this you know, highly trained, highly educated uh, proletariat that they employ um, will not be lifelong employed. And so how do we keep them in the area? How do we keep their, uh, their skills in place? And that is where uh, in Silicon Valley, the universal basic income thing comes from. So it's highly supportive by, by big uh, uh, tech capital. Uh, so there's, there's, a, there's a set of trends in there that I think are very interesting. Um, there are universal basic income schemes on local level in the Netherlands, in Finland there is a couple of uh, experiments, there are others. Uh, so that is, that is very interesting. Now, of course, this is all still on a national level. 
right? And you would like the European Union to be able to discuss these things, for example, on a European level too, but then still, I mean, where's the world level? Uh, there is no way, I guess, in which universal basic income can be discussed in China or in India. Um, so what you, what you have there is a set of discussions about uh, transfer programs, particularly in India or in South Africa. You have a guy like Jim Ferguson uh, in his book, Give a Man a Fish, you know, making a big party celebrating the fact that the South African state is now paying $18 a month to mothers. Well, that is of course a very, 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 very small step. Um, I don't celebrate with that. And he, he puts it in a sort of uh, controversies with continuing to support the labor unions. You know, forget about labor, forget about productions, now all about re uh, redistribution and let's focus on, I think that would be very, very stupid to do that. But you know, those discussions are very interesting. Um, again, how you regulate this on a global level, nobody has any idea. Nor is there any serious talk about that. We can talk about, about money. Well, you know, the whole system since 2008 has basically been saved by quantitative easing and flanking mechanisms. Right? So now about 25% of, of OECD GDP is in fact, well, not, you know, we always had fiat money, but this is entirely artificial fiat money, just produced by the central bank like that. Also absolutely fascinating, I must say, because until 2008, there was a complete taboo on something like that, right? Neoliberalism and ordoliberalism uh, would, 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 you know, I mean, you basically lock up every, every state leader who tries to do something like that. So the, the politicians didn't dare to do it, but a small coterie of central bankers decided it had to be done, and it had to be done. So we are now in a situation where we actually know, that is very interesting, and we don't really discuss the ins and outs and the consequences of that, but we know that we can actually manage the global economy and the national economy by ent entirely, on, on a public level, entirely artificially injecting the system with money. This is almost like, like Lenin, who runs the heights of the economy and is satisfied with that. Right? So we are in a situation where also the thinking is through of money and how the system as such is actually managed uh, is I think entirely open and there's a couple of uh, you know, very experienced people, um, can't remember the names now because I'm a bit tired, but in particular in the UK who have made an argument for, for literally for a public currency. Where the, where the central bank produces it here and you put it in your pocket there as the state and you spend it in another way than quantitative easing. Now I think all of these discussions are sort of um, pushing the limits of what we dared to discuss about 15 years ago. Um, they also sort of jump over where the old social democratic left um, got stuck. And they point to possibilities of a different form of capitalist management that could be more people's friendly and that might enable sort of mechanisms of solidarity to emerge uh, in, uh, in, in more managed contacts, in more globally managed contacts. But of course, all of this is entirely ut utopian. I personally think that all these utopian thought experiments have to be done. Uh, Don, let me ask a question uh, dealing with the state capacity, because uh, if I understood you correctly, uh, you mentioned the peace government policy, that instead of empowering labor and labor unions, uh, they are getting involved in some sort of um, redistribution policies, uh, <clears throat> thanks to taxing foreign capital. At the same time, you mentioned that uh, the taxation rates on capital are getting lower and lower and lower, and uh, as you put it uh, uh, brilliantly, uh, capital refuses to be taxed. 
So don't you see here the contradiction, or yeah. it's just an uh, uh, kind of electoral uh, rhetoric or manipulation on part of these imagined uh, extreme right parties uh, governing some Eastern European countries, which say, okay, we will uh, protect you, just get us elected, and when uh, once they elected, uh, they do nothing uh, uh, except uh, kind of uh, uh, reproducing this rhetoric of protection. Well, you, you are right that the policy of the PIS is standing out, right? <coughs> and it's also very interesting that they make really right-wing culturalist arguments for this, right? So the Polish family has to be saved, and the family has to be saved, not the gays and all those, you know, bachelor guys who circulate and circulate and enjoy themselves. No, the rooted Polish family has to be saved. The more children you have, the more income you have. And you know how much it is, right? So if you have four children in Poland, you get 400 euros uh, family benefit. That is as much as the median wage is. Right, so that is that is a massive redistribution, and it solidifies. Uh, well, where the does the money come from? The constituency. Well, yeah. So they are actually taxing transnational capital, but they do this. So they they they're pushing up the taxation rates, and that's why I'm saying they are completely unique in this. <laughs> they're pushing up the taxation rates, and of course, transnational capital doesn't like it. Now, what that means over time for the relationship between transnational capital and the Polish state, I do not know, but we know that historically speaking, if you push up those taxation rates too much, transnational capital says goodbye, because it can go anywhere, right? So it's an experiment, it has very strict limits, and it's an experiment where, and that is also interesting, where the labor-driven Polish right, because the Polish right is really labor-driven, clashes with Orban and with Jobbik and with the Hungarian right. So within the Visegrad, there's a lot of frictions uh, around this. Um, Orban has actually just reduced the taxation rate on capital again. It's now 16%. Um, but as I said, transnational capital effectively only pays about 3%. Um, but yeah, so, so while Hungary is still in the sort of downward pushing environment on, uh, on taxation, uh, Poland tries to create another sort of precedent. Yeah. Interesting. Let's see how far this goes. Interesting. Thank you. Thanks, yep. Don. І, шановні друзі, з рівня світової системи Європейського Союзу, Західної Європи, Східної Європи, ми поступово рухаємося в бік наших теренів, пост радянських, пост комуністичних і